In addition, in addition to our ongoing and vital work for democracy, local leagues in Illinois have a tradition of specializing on particular issues. League of Women Voters of Evanston works for affordable housing. League of Women Voters of Central Kane County works for criminal justice. League of Women Voters of Roselle Bloomingdale works for access to mental health care. And League of Women Voters of Naperville has a long history of working for environmental issues, beginning decades ago with the cleanup of lead shot in Sportsman's Park. We are also members of two amazing interleague organizations, League of Women Voters of the Upper Mississippi River Region and League of Women Voters of the Lake Michigan Region. Tonight, we're here to carry on the work of our Naperville League predecessors and advocate for a clean environment for our community. Now, I will hand off to Kathy Clarkin, member of League of Women Voters of Naperville and chair of the Naperville Environmental Sustainability Task Force. Kathy. Thanks, Becky. Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I want to extend a special welcome this evening to the folks from the League of Women Voters of Central Kane County who are co-sponsoring this program with us tonight. And a special thanks to Bill Kale for organizing that. Um, I'd also like to welcome some folks from the League chapter in Winnetka. The reason that Naperville got together with these sister leagues for this program is because Naperville, St. Charles, Winnetka, Batavia, and Geneva are all parts of municipal cooperatives. That means we get most of our electricity from coal fire generation plants, which also means we are responsible for the greenhouse gas emissions from those plants. So we're in kind of a different boat than other parts of the state that have um, like ComEd as their electricity providers when it comes to the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, CJA for short. So our speaker tonight, Amanda Pankow, will speak to how CJA is different for us as well as dive into CJA overall. So let me introduce Amanda. Amanda Pankow is with Prairie Rivers Network where she coordinates work with advocates, leaders, and communities to realize the benefits of clean renewable energy and address the cost of non-renewable sources such as coal. She previously worked as an environmental consultant in, on coal mining issues in Southern Illinois and as a leader and organizer in the region's local food system. She's a Central Illinois native with a BA in Ecology, Ethology, and Evolution from the University of Illinois, and an MS in Wildlife Ecology from Southern Illinois University. Thanks for joining us this evening, Amanda. And um, at the, um, as Amanda talks tonight, I wanna remind everyone that you can put your questions in the chat and we'll um, leave some time at the end um, for Amanda to address those questions. So um, it's all yours, Amanda. Thank you. Can you all see my slides? Yeah, great. Okay, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm so excited to share more about Illinois' groundbreaking legislation, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. It's actually celebrating its two month anniversary today. It was signed by Governor Pritzker just two months ago. Um, real quick, I, as Kathy said, I work for Prairie Rivers Network. We're a statewide nonprofit with a 50-year history working on um, water issues. Um, and if you aren't a member, we'd love for you to join and become part of our mission to protect water, heal land, and inspire change. So it's not often that when we talk about climate change, we have good news to share. So I, I debated on even talking about climate because I assume everybody here is kind of on board with the need to take aggressive action to tackle climate. But I wanted to share that our, our governor was just in Glasgow um, as part of the United Nations Conference of Parties. You'll hear this called the COP26. So it's the 26th time that nearly 200 nations have come together. It was the, at the COP21, yeah, 21 when the Paris climate agreement was born where these countries agreed to limit global warming 
to well below two degrees while pursuing limits or efforts to limit it to one and a half. Um, so Governor Pritzker attended this year's gathering and he was able to proclaim that he was there to say that in America's heartland lies a state that's taking strides to match the urgency of this moment. So now for a little bit about the, you know, the doomsday part of climate change. Um, I, the urgency of the moment was highlighted once again in August's climate report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as part of their sixth assessment. You probably saw this in the news being called a code red for humanity. Um, the authors called human influence on climate unequivocal, taking the kind of the strongest stance they had um, ever taken on that. They detailed how warming is already affecting weather and climate extremes, globally average rain, increases in globally average rainfall, sea levels, decreasing snow cover, retreating glaciers, the warming and acidifying of our oceans. And with all of that obviously impacts on some of our most vulnerable across the world. Um, and the report also said with every increase of global warming, these changes in weather and climate are going to be larger. So the report's findings um, and the reason for alarm were clear that we needed immediate, rapid and sustained reductions in emissions um, followed by net zero emissions or the goals of the climate or the Paris Climate Agreement would be far beyond reach. So it encouraged folks to read more about what happened just in Glasgow just this past week with the Glasgow Climate Pact. Um, the kind of the, the consensus is still coming out on if our world leaders have reached um, what we need to limit global warming below two and closer to one and a half degrees Celsius. But again, Governor Pritzker was there and it's a proud moment for, for Illinois and I'm happy to share more about what he was talking about. Um, but before I do, I'd like to take a step back and just talk a little bit about the background and lay of the land as to why and how the energy transition is happening around the country. And so then I'll move on and talk more about Illinois' current policy and then the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act that we just passed this September. So as you can see from this graph, coal is shown in, in the mustard yellow. The energy transition away from coal has been underway for over a decade. And since 20, 2007, over 45% of coal plants have closed. And in 2020, partially due to the pandemic, um, but for the first time on record in the US, renewables produced more electricity than coal and more electricity than nuclear. So this change has primarily been driven um, by falling natural gas prices, but other factors such as coal plant age, falling renewable prices, which we'll look a bit more at. And of course, pollution and climate concerns have also driven this transition. Um, and this is just the start of a transition that is rapidly accelerating. And we are projected to see this re upwards renewal, renewable trend to continue. So Illinois has been right along there with the nation on this transition away from coal with over half of our coal plants having closed in the last decade. Um, an additional seven um, coal plants have closures announced. So I've listed them here. It's kind of a lot of information, but I like to put it out and I'm happy to share my slides so people can go back and, and look at these things in more detail. Um, so even before we pass this new energy bill, um, all but four of Illinois coal plants had announced closure dates. By 2027, we would have only had four coal plants left. Um, this is now different because we passed this bill, but this just goes to show that this transition was happening in Illinois. And to date, it's been mostly unplanned and disordered. And by what I mean by that is we were seeing some of our cleanest burning coal plants close first. Um, communities that, that were home to these coal plants were have been devastated by these closures. When they lose the tax revenue, it can sometimes be up to like 20% of the school's funding coming from the taxes that these plants are paying. So the, the impacts from this was actually one of the things that I worked very closely on um, over the past few years with Illinois' energy policy was ensuring we supported communities and workers in this transition. 
But just a little more background here. As coal generation has fallen, deployment of renewables has increased largely in part to falling prices. So this graph shows a levelized cost of electricity for different um, generation sources over time. Um, so drawing your attention to the orange line that represents solar, the cost of utility scale solar has gone from the most expensive to the least expensive way to generate electricity over the last decade. Wind has similarly fallen, um, not as drastically, to become the second least expensive. And um, notably, um, the prices on this graph re graph represent um, prices without subsidies or incentives. So that you know this and I, some of the other things I've mentioned go to show that economics has driven a, a large part of our energy transition as well. Obviously, the need to do more and do it quicker is where tackling climate change comes in. So states like Illinois have been forward thinking in our energy policy um, to promote clean energy and a faster transition away from coal to, to tackle climate change. So before I shift and kind of talk about what Illinois energy policy regulations and law can do, we're going to talk about, and um, they already mentioned this a little bit in the uh, introduction, the kind of the difference and the different types of electric utilities, and this is relevant because they're regulated differently by our Illinois state government. So Illinois has three types of electric utilities. We have our investor owned, often called IOUs. Those are Ameren and ComEd. They're private for-profit companies and they're regulated by Illinois state law and by the Illinois Commerce Com Commission. Um, a group called the Citizens Utility Board is mandated by law to kind of be the watchdog for these, these investor owned utilities. Then we have our rural electric cooperatives, and these are nonprofit consumer owned utilities, primarily serving rural areas. Um, and they're governed by a board that's elected by fellow member owners. And then finally, that many of you here tonight are ratepayers and municipal run utilities. And these are owned and operated by local municipal governments and then governed either, either by city councils or utility boards. So again, the, the rural electric cooperatives, muni municipal run electric utilities, I'm going to call those co-ops and munis probably for short. Um, and they're not regulated by state law or by the Illinois Commerce Commission. So when, we, when I talk tonight about Illinois state law, um, I'm going to identify some areas where these, these things are different than what Ameren and ComEd customers are, are, are facing. Um, let's see. So I also have information here. These municipalities often join together to form joint action agencies. So two examples of that are the Illinois Municipal Electric Agency, um, known as IMEA. Um, and so I have St. Charles, Naperville, and Winnetka are all members of IMEA. And then there's the Northern Illinois Municipal Power Agency. Um, we call that NIMPA. And so both of these are examples of where the, the municipal governments have come together um, and then that agency on behalf of them works to secure reliable power electricity for their members often um, and that and often that's done through long-term power supply contracts so they're like Prairie State is an example of that there's these long-term contracts to buy power from entities and I have IMEA's power supply um, there in the pie chart. Um, so these long-term contracts as well as the lack of oversight um, and transparency are kind of two of the big problems we see with these agencies um, and kind of um, planning for a clean energy future and addressing climate change. Um, so as we want to speed this transition, the state has no, no authority to mandate changes for these entities. And similarly, the long-term contracts that these entities often have with coal, like the Prairie State Coal Plant, kind of lock them into buying that coal power, even as cheaper and cleaner sources of electricity become available. Um, so I'm going to talk now about energy policy that kind of laid the groundwork in Illinois. So this is a bill known as FEJA, the Future Energy Jobs Act that passed in 2016. 
And it's relevant to talk about because it created some of the programs that were expanded with the new bill called CJA. Um, so this bill was a bipartisan bill meant to jumpstart the clean energy economy. Um, it didn't do much to really tackle pollution or climate change. Um, broadly, it, it created renewable energy and energy efficiency and workforce development to help Illinois to get, get to a goal of 25% renewable energy by 2025. This is a goal known as the Renewable Portfolio Standard, and it only applies to investor-owned utilities, Ameren and Comet. So that's why I have it in red. So throughout my presentation, I've I've kind of put in red things that don't apply to municipal owned utilities. I've given this presentation a handful of times now. This is the first time I've given it to a group from municipal electric utility or a rural co-op. So I'll be kind of interested in feedback on, on how this information is presented because it's a bit tricky to, to kind of go over the whole bill and then also kind of share with you guys how it's different. Um, so this law mandated that, that Ameren and ComEd collect money from their ratepayers, and then that money would be used to incentivize wind and solar development um, through the use of something known as renewable energy credits or RECs. So these are incenti incentives to, to jumpstart wind and solar. Um, so interestingly, after FIJA was passed and Ameren and ComEd started collecting this money, and if I put solar on my roof, I get money to pay for the wrecks that I'm generating from my solar. There were several court cases to determine if municipal and rural electric customers could get those wrecks because you guys weren't paying into that pot of money. So ultimately the, the courts decided that the intent of the law was that every Illinoisan should be able to take advantage. So I, renewable energy credits I have here still in brown because municipal electric customers and rural electric cooperative customers can get incentives. If you put solar on your rooftop, you can get paid um, that incentive from the state, even though you're not paying into the pot of money. I have, I've indicated here in orange that there are still some barriers. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on what those are, but there's difficulty sometimes in net metering, um, and then I, like Community Solar is a new program that you can purchase a subscription in an offsite solar farm and then get credit on your utility bill, but it requires your utility to do some special accounting. And if, if you're a rural co-op or you, your municipality is not willing to do that special accounting, then sometimes participation in that program isn't possible. Similarly, the Solar for All program created under this bill made solar more accessible for low-income customers and for nonprofits that serve low-income customers. And there's also some issues in Muni, Muni co-op territory where nonprofits have a hard time going solar because they're not allowed to use something called power purchase agreements that allows um, someone as associated with the project to take advantage of the federal tax credits that are available. So it's a bit tricky, but I put those in orange because technically they're available to Muni Co-op customers, but there can sometimes be some red tape and depending on um, the municipality or the co-op, it might not be possible. Um, similarly, FIJA established goal, energy efficiency goals for Ameren and ComEd, creating new programs um, for those customers to make their homes and their businesses more energy efficient, um, which ultimately saves them money and creates lots of jobs those goals do not apply to Muni co-op utilities. Um, so thanks to FIJA, Illinois has become a leader in clean energy and clean energy jobs. By 2019, clean energy companies employed more than 125,000 Illinoisans, and those jobs were growing five times faster than statewide employ employment. These are obviously pre-pandemic numbers, and just like other sectors, the clean energy workforce was hit hard by the pandemic. But um, in late 2020, early 2021, this sector was growing back or recovering faster than other sectors. Um, so, so with what Illinois had done, um, we have become a leader in clean energy, but we also are still a leader in pollution from power plants, pollution from our transportation sector, 
So since 2016, there's been growing political will to do more um, when it comes to Illinois energy policy, especially to tackle climate change. So many advocates joined together um, as part of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. Um, Prairie Rivers Network is a member. Pretty much every environmental nonprofit that you can think of, consumer advocacy groups, frontline environmental justice community groups. Um, we had some individual members join um, parts of the Co Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition, including a few that are on this, the call tonight. Um, so in 2018, this coalition started talking to people across Illinois about the challenges and opportunities around Illinois' clean energy future. So this is a deliberate campaign known as the Listen, Lead, Share campaign to get public input on energy policy. And it resulted in over 100 community conversations, and it represents possibly the largest ever participatory public policy effort in the state of Illinois. So as you guys know, working on, on issues and advocating for issues that oftentimes policy is written you know, in a dark, smoky room, and then the legislators pass it, and there's little public input. So we wanted to do the opposite, and I think we were successful. Um, so the, the, the name of the campaign, Listen, Lead, Share, it was about listening to communities. It was about leading with a nation-leading climate bill. And then the final part, the sharing part, was then about sharing in the benefits of the new clean energy economy. So we're kind of in that share part of the campaign. Um, that's going to start with conversations like tonight, where we're talking about what's in this new bill, learning how people and communities can benefit, um, and then sharing in the rewards, um, the, the cleaner air and the jobs um, and justice that comes along with this new bill. Um, so from that Listen, Lead, Share campaign, the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition introduced the Clean Energy Jobs Act. So this is a bit of history now. Um, and this bill um, also has the acronym CEJA. So this isn't the bill that ended up passing, um, but these were the four pillars that kind of came out of that Listen, Lead, Share campaign. We wanted to have a carbon-free power sector by 2030, 100% renewable energy by 2050. We wanted to tackle pollution from the transportation sector, which is actually the leading source of carbon emissions from our state right now, the transportation sector is. And then finally, we wanted to do all of that in a just and equitable way. So, and then that's kind of why I keep this slide is this is an opportunity to, to share the coalition's commitment to justice and equity in, in tackling climate change and building a new economy. So our energy bill shouldn't just be about reducing carbon, carbon emissions. We can look at this as building a new economy and making sure that we're bringing jobs and economic opportunity to black and brown communities, to people in environmental justice communities, low-income communities. So um, it was an oppor opportunity to tackle pollution and environmental justice communities, ensuring we're closing those, those coal plants and gas plants sooner. So as we wrote all of these policies, we, we ensured that equity and justice were at the core of, the, of those policies that we were developed. And then we championed that throughout the whole negotiation process. Um, a lot of work it went into this. I mentioned that Listen, Lead, Chair effort started in 2018. We had two plus years of advocating. I'm sure many of you joined um, lobby days, which ultimately turned into virtual lobby days, um, climate strikes, town halls, educational events, et cetera. And then the bill, um, the, so the Clean Energy Jobs Act was the bill that came from the Clean Jobs Coalition introduced in early 2019. It really laid the foundation for this two years of not only advocacy, but of discussions with other stakeholders and negotiations around energy policy. There was other groups like the Clean, Climate Jobs Illinois, the Labor Coalition, um, Governor Pritzker had his own bill. Ameren had their own bill. Um, and so it was really two years of, yeah, the stakeholder negotiation process kind of uh, the, over the last, over 2021, it was a roller coaster um, for anybody that was following it. 
And ultimately the bill that was a negotiated bill kind of built on the pillars of the Clean Energy Jobs Act. The bill that passed is known as the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. It passed in mid-September and was signed by Governor Pritzker on September 15th. The law made headlines nationwide, it was being called the most equitable energy and climate law in the nation. Um, and so now I'm gonna get to dive in and share a little bit more about what makes this law so groundbreaking. Um, and again, kind of along the way, try to address some of the ways that it's different for, for municipal utilities um, and some of the ways we still have work to do. Whoops. So kind of like the four pillars of the Clean Energy Jobs Act, the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, that I'm also gonna call CJA. These are kind of the four things it does broadly. It tackles climate change and pollution by reducing carbon emissions, sets Illinois on a path to 100% clean energy, creates programs to ensure just an equitable clean energy workforce, and it holds utilities accountable and creates new consumer protection. I have a link here, which I can actually Go ahead and put this in the chat, maybe. We've developed a fact sheet specifically for Muni Co-op um, issues as it relates to the Clean Energy Jobs Act. I wouldn't necessarily say to open this, it doesn't necessarily flow along with my presentation or anything, um, but just wanted to make sure folks had that. Um, after you hear my presentation, definitely go back and you know, hopefully some of the things will, will make more sense, but it dives a little bit deeper in how this bill impacts municipal and co rural cooperative utilities. Okay, so the uh, CJA acts on climate change. One of the controversial pieces of the bill is the financial incentives or financial assistance that the bill provides for the Byron, Dresden, and Braidwood nuclear plants over a five-year period. So it provides 700 million to those plants over five years. This is approximately 5 billion less than what Exelon was asking for. Um, I mentioned the labor coalition that had their bill. They were really doing the bidding of Exelon and the nuclear plants because of the jobs associated with those plants. Um, and this is where the negotiations landed on that piece of the bill. Obviously an important source of carbon-free power to the state of Illinois. Um, Illinois is actually the large, has the largest nuclear generation of any state in the U.S. Um, CJA also requires that all private coal plants and oil-fired plants close um, by 2030. So that's actually... I mentioned after 2027, there was only gonna be four plants left anyway. That actually only applies to one coal plant, um, the peak in the plant in peak in Illinois, I think it's called Powerton. Um, and then after that, um, we're gonna require the phase out of natural gas over a 15 year period. So starting in 2030, some of the dirtiest gas plants and gas plants located in, envi in environmental justice communities have to start to come offline. Um, and then there's other interim closure dates that have to be met by 2035, 2040, and ultimately by 2045, all natural gas plants, if they own natural gas plants, have to eliminate carbon emissions. Um, and so then the last bullet point here in red, again, it's in red because it deals with muni a municipal utility issue. So municipal coal, including the Prairie State Coal Plant, and the um, coal plant in um, Springfield, Illinois, known as Dahlman, they have to close, or they have to be 100% carbon free by 2045 with an interim emission reduction goal of 45%, no later than the middle of 20, by June 30th, 2030. So at this point, we're gonna take a kind of step back and look a little bit more up at at the Prairie State coal plant since it is so relevant to your communities. Um, so it's owned 
by IMEA and NEMPA, the Illinois Municipal Electric Agency and the Northern Illinois Municipal Power Agency, owned by the, those and seven other public power authorities, those, or six other, so eight total represent 300 member municipal utility and rural co-ops stretching across eight states. So it has this really unique ownership structure um, that made it difficult to address closure in the bill. Um, it is the largest coal plant in Illinois and the top emitter of planet warming greenhouse gases in the state. Also one of the 10th largest greenhouse gas emitters in the US. It emits um, more toxic sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide pollution than any other source in Illinois. And those toxic pollutants and others um, contribute to 76 premature deaths a year. Um, my organization, Curry Rivers Network, um, we're kind of the coal ash organization in the state. Um, and I worked with my colleague um, to get some numbers on this, but they have a 750 acre coal ash landfill. Um, and the even though the power plant has only been in operation for nine years, the landfill already stores over 20 million cubic yards of coal ash. That coal ash is already polluting the groundwater in the area of the coal plant and mine. And that amount of coal, the amount of coal ash generated in just one year at Prairie State is comparable to the amount of coal ash created at other power plants over their entire lifespan. So I'm here in um, Champaign County is where our office is. Next door in Vermilion County, we've been fighting for coal ash, coal ash cleanup along Illinois' only National Scenic River, the Vermilion River, or the Middle Fork of the Vermilion. The coal ash at that power plant, it, you know, it was that power plant ran for over 40 years. There's more coal, more coal ash generated at Prairie State in one year than is at that coal plant from over its entire life. It's just a, and it's because it's a massive coal plant. Um, and I think some of the air pollution controls they have mean they generate more coal ash. So, Again, under CJA, Prairie State has to close or has to be carbon free by 2045. Um, so this actually is a really big win. Um, there were times in the fight for, for Illinois climate legislation that we thought that um, Prairie State would be completely exempted from the energy bill. So the fact that we have a closure date and that we have interim reductions along the way is a huge win. I have a screenshot here of a tweet from Senator Melinda Bush. This is from, um, I think, May 31st, when we thought we were going to pass the bill. And at the last minute, Prairie State arose as this sticking point where we had Senate Democrats saying they wouldn't vote for a bill that closed Prairie State. We had these Senate Democrats and some representatives stand up and say that we won't vote for a bill unless it includes the closure of Prairie State. And you'll recognize some of the the leaders here, Senator Karina Villa, Laura Elman, Janet Yang Rohr, were especially um, influential and strong in, in ensuring that Prairie State was not exempted from Illinois' energy and climate bill. I think if it wasn't for those women, um, we would have maybe ended up with a bill that just let Prairie State run into perpetuity. So I wanted to flag that, that they really stuck their necks out, um, did a lot of research along the way, worked with many of you, I'm sure. So thank you to you all as well um, for helping us get a closure date for this coal plant. Um, certainly what we know about climate change, we can't have Illinois' largest carbon emitter running until 2045, so there's still more work to do there. Um, I Again, I'll share my slides. I just put some Prairie State coal plant resources here. These are hyperlinks. So when you get my slides, you can click on these and um, learn more. I'm sure many of you have dove into this issue already. So I mentioned um, that one of the big things I worked on in this bill was ensuring that coal communities, um, coal, coal plant communities, coal mine communities, um, were supported in what we call a just transition. So this transition is, an, is inevitable, as we've already seen. We want to accelerate it, but we want to make sure that communities aren't left behind. 
So as part of CJA, we have something called the Energy Community Reinvestment Act. Um, and this bill, this part of the bill um, creates grants um, for communities that are undergoing the closure of a, a power plant or a coal mine to address the economic and social impacts of energy transition. And this is gonna be funded at $40 million a year. Um, we, we're creating an energy transition workforce commission to study and report on the workforce and community impacts of anticipated closures. Um, I mentioned that up to, to date, this transition has just been completely unplanned, disordered. Communities workers have been, um, unless they're union, have been very, um, or have been hardly supported. Um, the bill creates a displaced energy worker bill of rights to provide workers with advance notice, um, notifying um, them of some of the programs that the bill creates, um, as well as other employment and career services and financial planning services. All I didn't mention, these programs will be administered by the Department of Commerce and Ec Economic Opportunity. So it's charging them with supporting these workers um, when they lose their jobs. It creates a scholarship, uh, the Displaced Energy Worker Dependent Scholarship for um, children of displaced energy workers. So it's a one-year full-time scholarship to a state-supported school. Um, and then it uh, mandates the, the commission has to do a report every year on kind of what's happening um, with these workers and communities. Um, I have a little hyperlink here to a video. Um, this is a, a video showing um, the town of Havana after coal plant closure. They had three months notice of closure. So this is an interview of some of the workers, the mayor, an economic development person. I, I'm in the interview. This is back when we were just advocating for these policies. I have a few of these videos kind of placed throughout my presentation, and I'm not going to play them as part of my presentation tonight, but I like to put them there if folks want to go back and watch, because it really shows the, the people that were have been impacted in, in good and bad ways by the energy transition. You know, this wasn't just Illinois' environmental community wanting to tackle climate change. This was you know, the mayor of Havana, Illinois, wanting to find ways to deal with this energy transition. Um, so there's kind of ways to show the, the breadth and scope of this issue and what this bill ultimately does. Um, whoops, and it's wanting to play. Um, this is actually, a, this new program is something that Vistra Energy proposed. Um, we were kind of able to scale it back a little bit but it creates new incentives to put solar farms and battery storage projects on the location of shuttered coal plants. So we ha already have the infrastructure there, power lines, there's workforce there. So the idea is to, um, to also bring revenue back to those communities. So the grants that we've created, you know, they're not going to fund these communities forever. So this is a way to get new projects, new tax revenue flowing into those communities and ensure cleanup and redevelopment of those sites. Um, I mentioned that Illinois' transportation sector right now is the leading source of carbon emissions in the state. So the bill also tackles um, electrifying our transportation sector through incentives that will be created probably not they probably won't roll out till the end of the next year, next year but incentives for people buying vehicles um, for people and businesses and communities putting up charging stations um, it creates an EV coordinator position at the IEP the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency um, to manage these programs um, and then it also requires utilities to create beneficial electrification plans, but it requires ComEd and Ameren to do that. that. So that's, I again, have it in red here. Um, municipal uh, utilities and rural electric cooperatives do not have to develop these plans um, to kind of plan for the electrification of the transportation sector. Um, another way we're tackling climate change is through the development of a public schools carbon free assessment program that again requires Ameren and ComEd to do free standardized assessments at all public schools to identify ways that they can reduce greenhouse gas emissions 
Um, and the bill says there's a goal of creating carbon-free public schools by 2030. There's not a lot of teeth in that other than this assessment program and then a special carve out for renewable energy credits for schools. But you know, this is a, a big area where we're gonna have schools in the state left behind because Amher and, and Comet are charged with doing this only in their territories. Um, so CJA addressed what we called the so solar cliff, which was basically a, the running out of funds um, for those renewable energy credits that were really driving our solar workforce. So it creates new funding, um, ramps up the funding for those renewable energy credits. It establishes new renewable portfolio standard goals of 40% by 2030 and 50 by 2040. Again, just goals for Ameren and ComEd. And it creates new programs for those renewable energy credit incentives. A special carve out, you know, where they're saying, I think maybe it's 5% of those credits have to be used for schools. A certain percent have to be used for community driven um, community solar projects. A certain percentage have to be used for projects led by black indigenous people of color contractors. So it creates these new categories for those renewable energy credits. Um, it increases funding for Illinois Solar for All program that will bring, again, bring solar to low income customers, customers in environmental justice communities, and the nonprofits that serve them. This is a little video about a solar for all project in Champaign Urbana on the Cunningham Children's Home. I'm going to speed up things up here a little bit um, so that we have plenty of time for questions. I want to finish in the next five minutes or so. This is something in the bill that applies specifically to municipal utility and rural electric cooperative customers. It's a right to self-generate. So the bill says that munis and co-ops should recognize the benefits of solar energy and implement policies to allow residential and small commercial customers to connect to the grid with their solar array and to then fairly compensate them for the electricity that they're generating and putting back on the grid. Um, so I have actually, a, I don't know if you can read it, a screenshot here from Eastern Illini Electric Cooperatives um, solar policy. If you wanna go solar, you have to, um, and you wanna do net metering, which is where you get credit for the extra energy you're sending back to the grid, you have to pay for equipment it's like $8,600 or something. So it's completely, for someone with a smaller project, a home, it's not possible. So we're hoping that this new right to self-generate will require co-ops and munis to adjust their policies to make them more accessible. They're gonna have to make these new policies available within 180 days on their websites. Um, any customer, so if I was a customer in Eastern Illini Electric Cooperative and they keep this policy, I could file um, a suit against them. Um, the bill says using administrative review law procedure, which is basically an, uh, an aggrieved person has to bring a challenge in a local county trial court. So we're gonna, unfortunately, we don't have the Illinois Commerce Commission um, or other state authority making sure that this happens. It's gonna be up to citizens to bring suits and kind of establish standards of what this means. I think there's still a lot to be seen. We're hoping as these policies get put online, um, we can start putting pressure on co-op boards and city councils to, to address some of the issues because they're technically now legally liable with this right to self-generate clause. Um, CJA um, continues Ameren and ComEd's energy efficiency goals. Um, creates new funding mechanisms and programs, um, new equity programs. Again, energy efficiencies in red. All of this only applies to Ameren and ComEd customers. I already mentioned um, how the, the advocacy in this bill for equity and justice. This is a video about Rakai who was actually a participant in one of FIJA's, so the 2016 bill, FIJA had some workforce programs and she's a, uh, she com comes from the foster care system. And so that those FIJA programs also um, prioritized placement from 
incarcerated people and people from the foster care system. Anyway, her story is amazing. It's a great example of what these workforce programs that specifically target um, low-income communities, um, environmental justice communities um, can, can do. And so I recommend watching that. I love her, Kai. She's great. Um, so the new bill um, defines equity eligible communities. So these are going to be people in communities that are going to have preferred placement and workforce opportunities and contractor development opportunities. So they are defined as persons and communities across the state that will be prioritized for hiring and contracting and the renewable energy credit procurements. Um, so that the system will be designed to ensure an equitable distribution of state-sponsored funding to diverse businesses and workers. Um, the communities are geographic areas that would most benefit from these equitable investments. They include environmental justice communities, and other low-income and underserved communities. And then equity-eligible persons are persons that live in those communities. Um, and an equity-eligible equity contractor is a business that's um, majority owned by equity-eligible persons. It's a bit of a mouthful. I don't expect you to read everything on the slide right now, but this is kind of some of the data, environmental justice data. There's these R3 areas that look at at communities harmed by violence, incarceration, and economic disinvestment to determine um, the definition in the bill. So again, the, the, the point is that we are ensuring that there is money and opportunities available for equity eligible communities and individuals. Um, I think I'm gonna, skip over some of this for time's sake. Um, the, the bill creates a, a network of 13 workforce hubs um, that will be run by community-based organizations across the state. Um, they will be co-located with contractor incubator programs to help new businesses get off the ground. Um, energy transition navigators will be community-based organizations that are helping place find and place individuals, equity-eligible individuals in those workforce programs. Um, and then there's other funding and seed capital programs, like a new green bank um, to provide funding for, for new businesses, equity eligible contractors, um, and a grant program. There's a returning residents clean jobs training program for um, previously incarcerated people to get trained in clean energy jobs. Um, and then there's a whole section in the bill on utility accountability and ethics. It's very important. I'm, I'm gonna skip over it because it only applies to Amarin and ComEd. Um, definitely worth going through my slides later, but for time's sake, again, I have it all in red here um, because it does not apply to mun municipal electric and rural co-ops. Um, so rate making um, changes, new consumer protections for, for low income customers, um, so what's next? Um, I'm not going to speak to the local work going on, but I, I heard a little bit about what's going on in Naperville. Um, I'd love to hear more about what's going on in some of your other communities and encourage folks to stay involved um, because there's still a lot of work to do um, in municipal um, utility territory, um, not just in your region. I mean, there's munis all across the state that are dealing with some of these same issues. Um, we're going to be working across the state to implement CJA, both from a grassroots side and also working with state agencies as they develop these new programs. Um, we have a Muni Co-op Working Group as part of the Downstate Caucus of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. Individuals are allowed to join that group. Um, you have to sign some confidentiality norms. Organizations are also, really organizations are preferred to join, but individuals can. Um, we're going to be working um, to close the Prairie State coal plant sooner than 2045. We're going to continue to work on other sources of carbon from mining, transportation, agricultural land. I'll skip the federal stuff. I did want to ask folks to, to thank your legislator for passing CJA. So if you take this action alert, it's just a, an alert where you have to plug in your name and information. 
and you can thank your legislator for passing voting yes on the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act. And again, some of your legislators were some of the champions in making this happen. So definitely take the time to tell them thank you. Um, we are working right now to submit public comment on Prairie State's water permit renewal. Public comments are due by November 22nd. I'd be happy to talk with anybody in more detail about this. Um, this is their permit to discharge pollution into waters of the US. Um, they, I've come up with this talking points document along with colleagues. It's not final, it's in draft form, but I'm going to go ahead and share it. It provides information to help people develop their own comments. Um, we're gonna also have an action alert that will be added to that document. So um, this is a way to tackle pollution from Prairie State. And then I also have an action alert for taking action on climate at a federal level. And so I'll put that in the chat as well. Sorry, I had to rush through some things there at the end. I want to leave time for questions. All right, you ready? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thanks, that was that was really super informative. And um, I, I feel kind of proud of Illinois for, for doing this. I think it's, it's a huge step forward in tackling climate change. But as you said, we have more work to do. Um, and so before we, I'd like everyone to, um, you know, put your questions in the chat. There's still plenty of time for questions, but um, I also wanted to say that since we do have people from different communities that are part of Munis um, in this meeting tonight, if you want to connect with each other, you can put your name and your email address and we can collect those and we can make those connections because I think that different communities working together on the same issue of, of getting rid of our coal-fired electricity is going to be more powerful than if we work on our own. So if you want to connect, um, make sure that you let us know that. So let me get to these questions. So um, let's see. Um, curious about the dates. Any chance for those dates to be moved up? For the average concerned citizen, less familiar with policy formulation 2038 and 2045 seem like a long way off and not in line with what we hear nationally about what we need to do. Um, I guess first off, I, I agree um, that those states are nowhere near what we need, especially for cold fired power plant retirement dates. Um, so under this law, under the Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, there's no way, basically, there's a separate section that deals with the Prairie State Coal Plant and Dahlman, where they get to run longer. Um, you know, something could happen at a federal level that could close them sooner. Um, we have people working in the state um, to try to find other ways to close Prairie State sooner. Um, one of those is applying um, regulatory pressure. So I mentioned their water permit is up for review. They don't have an, I, an Illinois Environmental Protection Agency operating permit, which is their air permit. They should have one. They've been running for, it'll be a decade next year, and they've never had an operating permit. So we're talking about ramping up pressure on the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency to have them get an operating permit. Anytime we have these regulatory opportunities, we can make it more expensive for them to run, um, make them have to run less to meet environmental regulations. So we're looking at putting pressure on them that way. There is also opportunity for customers and uh, community members to talk with their city councils um, and their mayors and their leaders about these issues. If we were to see enough owners of Prairie State 
commit to not renew contracts, um, there, there could be, you know, it would, they could possibly ramp down production or ultimately have to close. Uh, there was just an election in Cleveland, Ohio, a mayoral election. Cleveland is part owner of Prairie State. They're a big owner. And there's people on the call that know more about this than I do. Um, but if we could, and, and the Prairie State was an issue in this mayoral election. We can drop an article in the chat about it. But if we could get Cleveland and some others to commit to not renew contracts, um, we could see um, the coal plant decline in, in that way also. And I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in that's on the call. Yeah, that's that's uh, great information that I, I personally didn't have. Um, there was a question about some of the smaller muni co-ops, you know, sprinkled throughout the state. Do you think that there's public awareness in those communities or people who are active on this? Um, we have a few contacts we're working with in Highland, Illinois. Um, I think we have a contact in Sullivan. Um, as far as the, the Muni Co-op Working Group um, that's part of the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition. Um, in general, I, I mean, I live in a very rural, I live in a, a, five, a county with 5,000 people in a very rural part of the state. I mean, and definitely climate change is not something on the agenda at local city councils. And unfortunately, um, you know, lots, lots of misinformation about blackouts and um, other other things. So I would say we have a long way to go of just building a broader climate movement across Illinois, um, reaching some of these more rural communities. Um, but definitely we think focusing on communities like Naperville, Cleveland, Ohio, that have a large ownership share in Prairie State that we can um, focus on those places that are a bit more progressive and make a difference there. And really the other communities will just have to come along. But it, yeah, someone from a rural community, I, I still wanna you know, change that public sentiment and get there eventually, but it's slow going. Yeah. Um, here's a question. If munis and rural co-ops were, re were required to adhere to the same standards as the public utilities, how much more effective would greenhouse gas reduction efforts be? So all other coal plants in Illinois, all the, the um, privately owned ones have to close by 2030. So Prairie State Coal Plant is our largest greenhouse gas emitter in the state. Um, if it was subject to the same laws as the others, it would be closing by 2030. I don't have the math on how much greenhouse gas emissions that would save over that 15 year period, um, but certainly, <laughs> Greg's got some math for you there. Um, but yes, um, that's what needed to happen. I mean, like I said, what we got was a win, so it's hard to, to come down on it, but definitely we need to do more. Yeah. So um, it's almost eight, so I'm gonna give you one more question. Um, how much resistance is there to the new act from utility companies? Um, I mean, there was definitely resistance from Ameren and ComEd in the you know, two plus years of negotiations. Um, I skipped over the slide about the ComEd scandal. Um, which you know was a, a terrible thing that happened, um, but ultimately it kind of opened the eyes of of legislators and of of the public that um, utilities should not write Illinois energy policy anymore. Governor Pritzker was very very clear on that from the beginning that they the utilities would not be in the negotiation room, um, and they weren't. So. They definitely aren't happy, but I mean, I haven't seen Ameren and comment in the news complaining um, about um, the bill that was passed. You know, they're definitely mandated to create new programs and have new ethics oversight. There's going to be a, an a ethics commission and an um, ethics monitor, like a compliance monitor position created at each utility. So, I mean, I think they're, they're moving forward. I haven't heard much resistance. Great. 
Well, thank you so much. This was this was so informative. We really appreciate you taking the time to educate us on this. And again, if if anyone from any of the other communities outside of Naperville wants to get in touch and work on this with us, um, please let us know. And I'll hand it over to Becky now. Okay, everybody, don't hit the leave button just yet. Um, thank you, Amanda, and thank you all for attending. This event was recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube channel, and we'll send you the link to that in a follow-up email. Our next event will be Wednesday, December 8th at 7 p.m., when we will have an interview with Naperville's new Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Coordinator, Dr. Janice Williams. Watch your email for an invitation. And now for some breaking news. On Wednesday, League of Women Voters will engage in civil disobedience in Washington, D.C. States across the country have introduced hundreds of bills that raise deliberate barriers to our ability to cast our ballots freely, safely, and equally. This week, two members of the Naperville League will be traveling to Washington and risking arrest to demand action on voting rights. Look for updates on our social media. Now is not the time to sit back and just hope that Congress does the right thing. Thank you all and good night. Good night, thank you.